И у нас еще одна лекция из разряда вот Basic Sciences, профессор Рольф Граф, с которым мы уже давно общаемся, посвящена она экспериментальным моделям животных в гастроэнтерологии. Я вот, если можно, предварю прям буквально одно слово, лекцию, поскольку мы уже достаточно давно знакомы, мы были в лаборатории, которая в содружестве с клиникой профессора Клавьена функционирует, то есть такая хирургическая клиника, и там вот такое содружество, оно дает мне потрясающие результаты научные. И вот просто из моих таких, то помимо того, что я там первый раз в жизни увидел МРТ для мышей, Вчера мы разговаривали с Рольфом Граф, у них теперь еще есть кибернож для мышей, где они моделируют значит, онкологические процессы и смотрят, как лечится. Поэтому вот Рольф Граф, руководитель этой лаборатории, пожалуйста. Thank you, Igor, for inviting me. And as a member of the Council of the uh, European Pan Pancreatic Club, I would like to extend our greetings and best wishes to the Russian Pancreatic Club. It's blooming, and uh, I think it's an honor to be here. And I was, I was given a task, or rather I chose the task, to review a bit the animal models of pancreatic disease that are currently used or have been developed to dissect the disease that sometimes is very difficult to understand in the human situation. So if you do a um, search on PubMed, you type in a few keywords such as model acute or chronic pancreatitis or pancreatic cancer, you get quite a few hits, particularly with mice and with rats. And uh, if you look at the distribution, this is not hard science, this is just sort of a, an overview. Um, you, you will find that uh, acute pancreatitis is, is most commonly used with uh, mice and rats, while, for instance, pigs and dogs have still have been used, particularly in the past, not so much now. Uh, also cats, zebrafish for certain approaches, the opossum, very exotic animal. Uh, I would like to say that dogs and cats are not in use anymore, particularly in certain societies where um, they are uh, commonly used as pets and uh, the society will not accept this sort of uh, uh, use, whereas pigs you can eat, you can also work with, um, is more useful and also may have some clinical uh, or preclinical implications. So I'm just going to go through some uh, very basic things. Of course, uh, we can start with acute pancreatitis and uh, uh, go on to chronic pancreatitis and end up with pancreatic cancer. Uh, this is sometimes a sequel, sometimes not. Uh, pancreatic cancer um, is a risk factor for chronic pancreatitis. In animal models, mostly it's not the case. So you, if you want to work on pancreatic cancer, you don't go to chronic pancreatitis and then try to to uh, get the second or third hit. So if you look at the morphological changes, very summary here, uh, on the left you have uh, acute pancreatitis, on the right uh, chronic pancreatitis. Acute pancreatitis is, uh, among other uh, things, um, in the pancreas, uh, characterized by edema, inflammatory infiltration, and of course what everybody's worried about is necrosis. In chronic pancreatitis, it's a more subtle changes that uh, take years to form, which is, uh, for instance, plug formation that uh, clog the ducts, inflammatory infiltration, also necrosis may be a factor, fibrosis, and stone formation, which is a late event, um, but very typical for uh, chronic pancreatitis patients. Along with that, cellular changes, ductal hyperplasia or ascendant to duct, metaplasia, and of course fibrosis. So several factors may contribute to pancreatitis, um, among which of course is alcohol. Everybody believes alcohol is one of the causes. However, I'm more and more convinced that alcohol is not the major factor. It's rather smoking, but you will never see an alcoholic without the smoke. So it's hard to distinguish, and uh, I, I believe that now there is some evidence that smoking is much more important than alcohol, but uh, suffice it to say that you should get away from both. 
also duct obstruction from gallstones or other um, obstruction types like from tumors may cause some um, uh, changes in the pancreas and of course genetics um, have a large part in this whole uh, pathophysiology of um, pancreatic diseases. So why do we need a model? Well if you look at the problems in human disease um, in human pancreatic research first of all the incidence is quite low uh, still low compared to other diseases, so it's good for the population. You don't have uh, hundreds and thousands of patients, you have a lot, but you don't have that many compared to colorectal disease or others. So it's good for the population, but maybe difficult for the investigator. It's in a not so easy um, location, retroperitoneal location, not so accessible. And also, it's, it's a bit labor, meaning that if you want to take biopsies, you m might uh, run into the danger of uh, risk of induction of pancreatitis or aggravation of the current condition. So usually surgeons or pathologists don't like to, or gastroenterologists don't like to take biopsies uh, for fear of uh, worsening the situation. So, of course, animal models should somehow reiterate certain pathomechanisms. There's no perfect model, um, meaning that you cannot do everything in one particular animal model, but at least if you have a question, you should be able to address it in a suitable model. And of course, the design should be based on a certain ideology and not just uh, um, hit the animal with a hammer and hope it develops pancreatitis. You have to do something that is hopefully similar to the human disease. Um, I mentioned that already. And of course, if possible, it should be cheap, fast, and reproducible. You don't want to do animal experiments where, which take two, three years because then your competition will uh, maybe think of different things and do it faster. So it has certain aspects of e economy. And of course, thinking about this, you avoid pigs if you, if you can do it in a mouse or in a rat, because usually rats and mice, everything develops a bit faster. Uh, also in terms of genetics, it's easier. So there was a, a publication, a review, on uh, uh, some current models of pancreatitis, particularly acute and chronic pancreatitis, um, in 2013 by Markus Lehr and uh, Fred Gorlick, who basically summarized the, um, the current models. I'm going to go over some of them. I would like to mention, for in oh, sorry, would like to mention, for instance, just as uh, as an example, this doesn't reach. Okay doesn't reach here. Um, the DBTC model was a, a model which is very toxic and it should, in my view, not be used, so I don't really mention it. It was developed in eastern Germany where there's a lot of tin in, in, uh, ship, in the shipyards and it turned out that they developed uh, pancreatic, pancreatitis, but it's a model that's very harsh on the animal. Anyway, so I'm first going to go to the acute pancreatitis and of course uh, the cerulean model. Cerulean is a CCK analog, a stable analog which has been used uh, for, for quite a few uh, years, I would say decades. Uh, then there are other types, uh, obstructive, invasive procedures, amino acids and so on, that can all be used to answer certain questions in acute pancreatitis. So again, if you go to PubMed, and um, put in secretagogue-induced pancreatitis uh, cerulean. You get 3,000 hits in PubMed, mainly coming from rats and mice. What they do usually, and this was work performed in the 70s by Lampel and Kern in uh, Marburg, where um, they injected uh, doses, high doses of cerulean or CCK into mice and they developed some kind of pancreatitis. Uh, this is a bolus injection of 40 to 50 micrograms per kilo, and you do that uh, at hourly intervals between 6 and 12 times during a day, or you can even repeat it further on in the next day to enhance the reaction. So why is this? Why, why use CCK or cerulean? Well, 
if you look at the at those response curve of the secretagog sec reaction, uh, you measure on the y-axis some release, let's say amylase. You can see that with increasing doses of CCK or cerulean, you have an increasing uh, response. However, unlike other dose response curves, you have a bell-shaped curve, meaning that high doses um, cause a reduction of secretion in amylase or any other um, uh, secretory enzyme in the pancreas. And this actually causes an aberrant secretion into the interstitium and not a normal current apical secretion as it is normally uh, derived to actually end up in the ducts. So this is actually the basis for this type of model. And what you have at the very high doses, you induce uh, pancreatitis. Pancreatitis such as this on the left is a uh, control section, histological section of a mouse uh, pancreas, and on the right uh, you see um, cerulean induced pancreatitis. It's still considered fairly mild. It has inflammatory components. It is uh, has, shows edema, and therefore it is considered a, an edematous type of pancreatitis. Uh, mostly a model that uh, easily regenerates, so if you inject cerulean and two days or three days later it already starts to regenerate and 14 days after you hit this um, pancreas or this mouth with cerulean, the, the pancreas looks fairly normal and regenerated. There are other models, injection models, for instance, the arginine-induced model. This has been pre, um, recently been used quite a bit. I'm a bit suspicious. We tried it too in our lab. And the problem it really is it's very susceptible to strain differences. So in a black six mouse, it may work. In a Bob C mouse, it may not work the same way. Now, if you are interested in genetic approaches, you, you want to test a knockout mouse, you always have mixed backgrounds, and then you have to develop again the whole procedure, and it shows tremendous strain differences. It's not uh, completely 100% penetrant, meaning that not all mice develop it, and then there's also a lot of uh, mortality, so uh, the, the, the window of opportunity is quite small. So there are also invasive uh, techniques, for instance, retrograde infusion of bile acids, torcolate. This is basically based on the fact that you have, may have compression of the duct and uh, some, some of the bile, duct, bile juice gets into the pancreatic duct. If you do that, you really develop quite a heavy um, acute pancreatitis with um, changes, uh, with necrotic changes that also are often um, um, lethal to the animal, so you have a high morbidity. You can see on the right hand uh, lower slide, uh, lower part photograph, a hemorrhage of the pancreas, and this may lead to death. Also, invasive techniques, you add a trauma, you have to open the animals, and, and of course this may add to the whole uh, uh, problem. So this is a model for necrotizing pancreatitis. So let's move on to chronic pancreatitis. Again, cerulean has been used, alcohol, and so on. So if you look at chronic pancreatitis, it has been assumed that 70 to 80 percent of the patients uh, suffer from some kind of alcohol abuse, some are heredit hereditary origin. You also have autoimmune disease, tropical pancreatitis, and then there is quite a number of patients that uh, it's still unclear what they really, uh, what's the etiology, the reason for their disease. Uh, if you look at alcohol, of course, um, this being one of the major reasons for a long time, um, people tried to mimic this in animal models. So this um, experiment, for instance, took 18 months, one and a half years of feeding of ethanol, high doses of ethanol in rats. And what did they see? Basically not much. Minor changes that are hardly distinguishable uh, from regular rats that have been fed normal chow or normal food. 
In dog, it's a bit, quote, better, but certainly not perfect. You do see some increased protein, protein concentration in, bio, in uh, pancreatic juice, plug formation, but it also takes one year of feeding of alcohol, and it's certainly not a good model uh, for uh, chronic pancreatitis. And so what my conclusion is, and if you look at the epidemiology, I want to repeat that, chronic application of ethanol alone is really not a good approach to chronic pancreatitis. So why, why would you think that's the case? Well, if you look at the epidemiology, also at the patients, only a small percentage of alcoholics really um, develop chronic pancreatitis. So there must be confounding factors, such as, and we call that a se uh, second hit, such as a genetic predisposition, diet, or other diseases. So, of course, people have used animal models, uh, alcohol plus something else, like a high-fat diet. You do see some focal inflammatory lesions in animals, fat discombination, but again, it's not really perfect. Um, duct obstruction with block or oils, also something that has been used in the past, but it's, again, not really very convincing. Then, of course, uh, LPS and endotoxin. Why endotoxin? Because alcohol is supposed to change the barrier, the gut barrier, and maybe in these animals, uh, and in, in humans, there may be some uh, transfer of uh, particles or parts of bacteria into bloodstream and increase the level of endotoxin or LPS. And so this is a mimicking of, of the situation. And indeed, ethanol seems to amplify the LPS-mediated damage, uh, enhance necrosis, and this in a cro more chronic state. You could also say the, the reverse LPS amplifies the ethanol-mediated damages. So we conclude you need a second hit and in my view, it may be smoking, and maybe it's not even the second, it's the most important hit, uh, certainly for um, pancreatic cancer. Smoking is really a, risk, a, a, a serious risk factor, and alcohol may be an, one of these uh, second risk factors. So going back to models, um, you can do many things with animals. You could also, for instance, target one particular type of uh, aspect of the disease of chronic pancreatitis of fibrosis. So what do you do? You could in, uh, inject TGF-beta because TGF-beta activates stellate cells. This has been known for quite a while and thereby provoke fibrosis in the pancreas. And indeed, this has been observed um, quite um, strongly in animals that have been also treated with cerulean in a repeated acute type of situation. So you combine an acute situation and add TGF-beta by injecting the cytokine and you do get some fibrosis. Again, there are some invasive techniques in chronic pancreatitis, such as duct ligation or retrograde infusion into uh, the pancreatic duct, uh, for instance, TNBS. It's a toxin that somehow simulates the bile acid, uh, dam bile acid mediated damage. And um, this really, uh, particularly duct ligation, causes uh, severe changes in the pancreatic morphology. You get um, metaplasias, you get duct, uh, ductal changes, which um, may take quite a while in large animals and may take Bit, uh, not so long in rats and mice, maybe a few weeks. Um, but again, you have to consider that if you do a complete duct ligation, the animal may have a severe problem and die. If you do partial duct ligation, uh, only par part of the uh, pancreas, it may not be a severe uh, damage. Just to review, uh, obstruction has been tested in many uh, animals. Um, in cats, dogs, rats, opossums, or injection of oils. They've been tested. Um, currently, they're not much in use anymore, but uh, in the past, it's been uh, used particularly, it has been used because many um, societies allow this type of um, 
experiment, but now are more conservative, more restrictive towards allowing experiments with uh, cats and dogs, as I just mentioned. So this is just one example of an obstruction of a dog uh, model. Uh, I would not use it personally, so it's ligation of pancreatic duct. Uh, you leave them for 12 months. They Indeed, these dogs uh, develop some inflammatory um, disease, fibrosis, duct dilation, and even stones. And the question was also whether they develop diabetes, which is sort of one of the um, complication of chronic pancreatitis. They did both two types of procedures, a partial pancreatic duct ligation or a complete duct ligation. And what they could see indeed is a stone formation. Stone formation I've never seen in any small animal models, uh, in cats or mice, never seen this. Um, of course, you may say it's not really that interesting because it's a late development in chronic pancreatitis. And in this model, they also observed some changes uh, akin to diabetes with uh, glucose clearance that is impaired. So there's genetic approaches, hereditary pancreatitis um, with, the, with the identification of the muta mutation in trypsinogen and later in uh, SPINK in a trypsin inhibitor. There was a big move and people thought now we know the, the pathomechanisms that lead to chronic pancreatitis. And of course everybody, there was a big hype. Uh, people started to make transgenic mice and uh, they used mutant trypsinogens to transfer into mice, uh, both from mouse trypsinogen and human trypsinogen. Unfortunately, the experiments were not very successful. It seems biochemically, when you do it, you do an analysis in vitro, you see different stabilities of trans trypsinogens, but in vivo, in the mouse, uh, we do not see a strong phenotype. So this was a bit of a this disappoint, uh, disappointment. I will go over this quite uh, quickly because we're already late. Genetic approaches knock in, not knock out. Transgenes um, in mice and uh, WBN cobrat. Um, again, I would like to remind you we've seen uh, TGF beta injections previously. Now you do this in, in the mouse by transgene overexpression. You do get severe disease by uh, uh, changes within two to three months after birth of the animal, uh, fibrotic changes, and the pancreas would not be recognizable after um, two to three months of age. Um, the WP and CORAT, uh, we have used that. This is a model that has been used in Japan a lot. It's actually from the development of the disease, it's quite an interesting model. It's spontaneous, has a high penetrance. It shows ductal damage, inflammation, fibrosis, and even diabetes. Initially, it was thought a model of diabetes, but if you look at the progression of the disease, you see that fibrosis occurs at three to six months, while diabetes is observed much later. So it's, more, it's a better model for chronic pancreatitis and not really a model of diabetes. And this is some of the pictures that you see in this model, which are quite uh, dramatic. We also uh, looked at autoimmune pancreatitis to end this, this talk here. Um, in our lab, we did a transgene with lymphotoxin, which is a TNF beta or belongs to the TNF beta uh, family of lymphotox uh, of um, cytokines. If you do make animals tr uh, transgenic for lymphotoxin, drive this lymphotoxin in the asthma cell, you see vast uh, changes with the tertiary lymphoid follicles production, and you also see um, immune, yeah, an immune reaction and an autoimmune reaction with IgGs derived against uh, pancreatic as well as um, other serum factors. And finally, there is another model. There are several models of autoimmune pancreatitis. Um, the MRLMP mice, which are autoimmune prone background of mice, and these um, mice, if you inject them with poly-IC, develop severe uh, inflammatory changes, a lot of lymphocytic um, cells and uh, autoimmune reaction. Now, I'm not going to talk about the cancer because basically um, cancer develop um, 
pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma has been studied quite well. It's, uh, all models are based, or most models are based on the KRAS mutation, which, is, which occurs very early during um, panin lesions. And um, what I would like to point out now is that besides the ductal part, there's also an acinar origin because KRAS um, mutations driven in acinar cells will also lead to panin formation. And this model has been used worldwide quite a bit. And there are many different approaches how you can um, include uh, other factors like P53 or other cytokines that drive uh, this reaction. Uh, ending up with a mouse with either just pan information or um, bona fide cancer. So these models, um, interesting, many are artificial, not really reflecting etiology. They're also strain dependent. Genetic models, you have to make sure that you are beware of the background and also beware that if you do transgenic mice, uh, you have promoters that drive this, uh, these uh, proteins, that, that they are really clean and that, that you don't have expression of a particular uh, transgene in another organ where they also could cause damage. And with this, I would like to end and thank again for your attention. Thank you very much for your talk, and uh, I think that we have a little time for questions. Yes, какие-то вопросы в аудитории? Пожалуйста. Professor Graf, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I've got a little question. What is your personal recommendation for young researchers to which model should they use for experimental chronic pancreatitis? Chronic. For which disease? For cro chronic pancreatitis. Chronic pancreatitis, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, currently... Subjective, su subjectively. Yeah, subjective, of course. Okay, we, we used uh, WB and Cobrat, and it was a, a very good model to study certain effects, but the, the problem, is, or it's not a problem, it develops and you cannot stop it. You know, it, it is an unknown genetic predisposition which causes chronic pancreatitis in these males. So you have to go along with that. In the mouse, now you can do a lot with cerulean injections. You can give, um, uh, let's say, three, four weeks of cerulean every other day, which is labor intensive and a bit annoying, but at least you can work in the mouse and you have the opportunity to use transgenic knockout mice. So I would certainly go in that direction because everything points towards this. Again, it's, it's not a perfect world and if you look at cerulean injections, if you have to do six injections once a day for three, four weeks, it's a lot of, a lot of work. You have to keep controls, you have to make sure you have the, 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 uh, but, um, the genetic background is very important, otherwise you compare apples and pears. So currently, serulin model is the optimal, for yes. your opinion. Well, thank you. Пожалуйста, еще вопрос есть какие-то? Спасибо за очень интересное сообщение. Thank you for your very interesting presentation. Uh, on the basis of the experiments you have made. Uh, uh, acute and uh, chronic pancreatitis are different diseases or are they stages of one and the same process? Pancreatitis. Are they different diseases or simply stages of one disease? What is your okay, so the question is um, are these are acute and chronic pancreatitis different diseases or stages? I guess if you, I'm not a medical doctor, I have to say, I usually put that up because I'm, you know, a biologist, so I, I don't see patients. Um, but um, if, you, if, if you look at the literature, um, I think the older gastroenterologists look at it as completely different diseases because sometimes etiology is completely different. Um, if you look at hereditary pancreatitis, of course, 
It's a different disease from acute pancreatitis. But for many approaches in, in basic science, you, you basically go from an acute to a more chronic situation. You never reach the, the vast fibrosis seen in chronic pancreatitis in man. In, you never reach that in an animal, or hardly ever reach that in an animal. So the, the models here are quite um, uh, not really always reflecting the human disease. Now, whether there are two, I, I believe chronic pancreatitis is a different disease from acute pancreatitis. Um, because many patients with, with acute will never develop chronic, and it's a one-in-a-lifetime disease. So I assume it's different. Thank you very much for a wonderful lecture. Uh, can you say some words about the efficacy of these models? Uh, you, you, I, I mean uh, acute pancreatitis. It, it is 100% efficacy, or it's a little bit less? Well, yes, uh, in acute pancreatitis, I would say the, the serial model, which is the most used model, um, it's, it's close to 100. So you are pretty sure that you get a response. However, as any biological response, you know, uh, having a 100 or 80 or 70 percent of, of a factor, you're getting maybe 3,000 or 5,000 or 10,000 units of amylase, that is still within the the variation of the response to the disease, but certainly they will all, always develop a certain amount of disease, like in humans, not, not every disease is the same. And, yeah. Thank you, and uh, the second question, very short. Uh, uh, if you follow up the mice or rats or animals, the uh, disease is caused by the stages like in human. So there is uh, necrosis, there is uh, period complications, there is a recover, a recover, or it's uh, only onset of the disease. You, which you. Well, you know, most people are working on on the onset of disease. One of the observations in in mice, for instance, and rats is that um, these uh, animals can regenerate quite well. So. If you go to your cerulean, you can even hit um, a mouse with uh, 20 doses of cerulean over two weeks. And if you look one week later or two weeks later, you will have an almost regenerated um, pancreas. So the potential, the regenerative potential is maybe a bit better than in humans. So if you want to, this, uh, for instance, develop therapies, you have to do that very early on, otherwise, it fixes itself. So um, necrotizing pancreatitis, the acute situation, for instance, there it's a difficulty that, of course, um, they may die. So you, again, you have to go in very early. People mainly go for um, um, lung um, com uh, complications in the lung. And not very often I, you see uh, models that also approach uh, multi-organ failure and all of these uh, septic uh, complications and shock. This is most commonly not used in or looked at in um, these models. Thank you very much.